Waiting on John, as usual. That's from Instagram. Right? How are you guys doing? That's good. I can't. No, that's Facebook. There's no response. I think we're live on Facebook. We are live on Facebook? Yeah, I'm not good at the social media we stuff. We know, John. We know. <laughs> What's going on, guys? It is Throw It Out There Thursday, and we are talking about a subject that I am very well familiar with. It is body rolls. Isn't it Tuesday, Bo Steve? Body roll. Yeah, Tuesday. So, it's Tuesday, yeah. not it Thursday. Tuesday all day. Is it Thursday? It's or it's Tuesday. Tuesday. It's, it's Tuesday. Tech Tuesday, whatever. Yeah. But we're talking about body roll, and I know a mm. lot about that. But in order to talk to someone that knows even more about it, we got to go over to Justin Smith. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. Um, body rolls, I re resemble that too lately. I've been, been working on a little bit of the rolls of my own. But that's not actually what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about body roll, singular, when it comes to UTBs and other things too. And um, kind of dispel some of the rumors. Uh, that a lot of our customers call and have questions about on what controls body roll, what the effects are, some of the things that uh, can improve or, or make it worse. So we'll talk about all that kind of stuff right now if you guys have time. So Steve, thanks again. Uh, we got John in the house. We got Mitch in the house. If you guys have any questions with regard to body roll, then ple please send it. That way that these guys can uh, read it and we'll answer it for you. Body roll, what is it? Well, when you're in your car, and you make a turn, let's just say you're gonna make a left-hand turn for me, going to your right at the moment. The outside of the car leans down and out, the inside of the car comes up, the top tips to the outside of the turn. If you take a look up here, if this is your UTV and you're making a right-hand turn from the rear, the car is gonna go this way, then it's gonna to lean to the outside. That's basically body roll in a nutshell. <clears throat> some of it you want, some of it you don't. Too much of it can be a bad thing depending on your terrain and how you're going to drive. Um, not enough of it can be a bad thing too. Kind of go over all that kind of stuff. Well, body roll causes. Simply put, the easiest thing that's going to cause and contribute to body roll is going to be excessive weight on top of the vehicle. If you start stacking up a whole bunch of spares, wheels, tires, all kinds of stuff up here, let's say a, a chase rack with a tire in it and jacks and a cooler and maybe a six pack right on top because that's how everybody I know goes pre-running. Then all that weight is gonna add to the body roll as you enter a corner and continue through it. So control some of the weight that's on top and that will help body roll issues. Another thing that will cause some body roll is too tall. That's the ride height of your vehicle being too high. The higher that you run this UTV or you, your UTV, the more prone it is to rolling out on the outside of the corner. That's just common sense, right? Well, conversely, the lower you run it, the less body roll typically you're going to have or chance to roll over. But there's negatives to both of these. We'll talk about that here in a second too. Another one is shock tune. Well, what I mean by that is on the inside of the shock, how it's valved, the piston that's chosen, um, free bleed shims, possibly free bleed holes in the piston, um, internal bypass shocks, the side stacks that are chosen, um, anything in the low speed range of adjustment on shock tune can cause body roll. The reason is that body roll is a slow moving event when it comes to how shocks are gonna control that. That's a shaft movement that's fairly slow. So as the shock compresses slowly, there isn't very much valving that's actually contributing to helping you with that. Um, compression valving on a piston typically isn't open with that. It's all gonna be in the free bleed passages uh, where you're gonna tune for tuning on body roll. <clears throat> sway bars. Either you do not have any sway bars on your vehicle if you have a ton of body roll or you don't have enough sway bar, as in not stiff enough. Sway bars are um, very, very important. Their job pretty much in life is to limit body roll. So it's the number one thing that you really want to jump on or add to your vehicle or get something that's adjustable to be able to control body roll in all terrains and driving styles. Sway bars don't typically give much of a negative to your vehicle. Here's one over here. We got visual, visual aid, Steve. So this is a sway bar for the front of an XP 1000, right? And turbo. So normally this sway bar is going to be held onto the frame right here where my hands are in uh, sway bar bushings. 
And if you hit a bump straight on in the vehicle, this is connected to the control arms on the front. If you hit a bump straight on, the tires are gonna go up both sides and the sway bar is going to go up and down with those wheels and tires as they go over that bump. You're not gonna have any effect from this sway bar if you hit things straight on. You're not gonna have any negatives. The way a sway bar works is when you turn in, <clears throat> I'm gonna put this on as if I was driving it going forward. As we turn in, this side of the bar is going to go up as the suspension is compressed and the car leans out. This side wants to pick the inside tire up because now the inside and outside wheels and tires are connected to each other via the arms and linkage. So whatever the outside tire does, the inside tire wants to do too. So if the, if the outside one goes up, the inside one comes up. If you pick the inside tire up, the car falls onto that, onto that tire, keeping the level of the chassis much more flat and the body roll to a minimum. This bar is measured in how they work in stiffness. It has a spring rate. That spring rate is if I could take this side and lift up on it and take this side and push down on it, basically twisting the bar, phys physically twisting the bar right in the middle. That twisting force is a spring rate and you can get them softer, stiffer, whatever you might want. So for instance, on this one, I don't remember exactly what the rates are on it, but I think it's between 250 pounds to 500 pounds of rate. So on the softest setting, it's gonna give you resistance of about 250 pounds. If you go to the stiffer settings, you can get as much as 500 pounds of, of spring rate. That rate is what's actually going to limit the body roll by keeping the vehicle flat in a corner. That's the generic way a sway bar works. We'll go back to some of the details on how you can adjust that and make it better in a minute. <clears throat> links. Sway bar links are, are a possibility um, to, to contribute. This is because some of the factory links come with rubber bushings on the end of them. That is the link that connects the sway bar to the suspension. Links are pretty popular. People buy them because they're visual. But the factory links can have rubber bushings in them, and those rubber bushings give a lot of movement. So when you turn in, it squishes the bushing, squishes the other bushing, squishes the inside bushing and the outside bushing, both on each side. That's a lot of play before the sway bar can start to work. So sway bar links, when you get rid of the soft bushing style, factory style typically, to a good aftermarket one like ours, which is a solid rod end, then you're not gonna have any movement in the link and it will limit some body roll. Tires. Tire construction and air pressure are really big contributors to body roll. If you have low air pressure when you turn in, that tire is going to squish down. You're gonna have flex in the sidewall. The sidewall is gonna roll underneath the wheel. That's gonna to contribute to body roll as you come in. If the sidewall construction is single ply or very soft sidewall construction as opposed to a stiff sidewall, then it's gonna roll over, it's gonna squish, it's gonna have all the same characteristics as the low air pressure does too, which adds to body roll. <clears throat> Last, <clears throat> excuse me, last is geometry. What I mean by geometry is, is how the front suspension and rear suspension are designed. It's typically something in a UTV you're not gonna be able to change. It's something you have to live with, but um, you can design into front suspension um, pivot points, um, both in angle of pivot, um, in, in vertical, vertical pivot angles, front to back, you can change the upper to the lower. You can add um, anti-dive to the front, changing from the side angles of the control arm pivots as the control arms pivot up this way. You can do one of these and you can add, bot, add, uh, add or remove um, anti-dive. Anti-dive helps with body roll because if you come into the corner, typically you're gonna be hitting the brakes to enter it. And if the nose doesn't dive very much, then it has less body roll. So geometry is a big factor. That's why you find some UTVs have more body roll than others. It's typically because the geometry is different. They might concentrate on certain things. Um, geometry on one might concentrate on going over whoops fast and another one might concentrate on turning. A good example would be uh, a YXZ turns really well, um, doesn't go through the whoops very well. Uh, Pro R um, goes through the whoops like a mad dog, but if you really have to concentrate on how you want that thing to turn and tune sway bars and everything else to make it have less body roll to huck a corner really fast. Uh, also weight in, in a Pro R is a little higher and that's gonna contribute to body roll. Steve. 
Justin, a question I get all the time, we're just going to say specifically for an X3, mm-hmm. the rear sway bar, we set our link to seven and three quarter. Yes. Okay. What would happen if I set that to eight and three quarter? If I made the link longer? <clears throat> so specifically on the Can-Ams, they're very susceptible to the sway bar and link length. Let's go over to this one over here. It's an easy one to walk over to, or there's one right here. Let's take a look at this. So usually the shorter the link assembly or the closer that the sway bar is mounted to the pivoting point of the trailing arm or a control arm means that this link is more sensitive. But another thing that contributes to that is the overall length of the sway bar arm on the side. The shorter these are and the more travel you have, the more susceptible and very, very picky this length is going to be. I can't show you without cycling this, but <clears throat> if this link is made, say, half an inch longer, when the whole assembly cycles vertically, if you hit a bump, it can go so high, if this link is too long, it'll try to rip the bar off the mounts and over cycle. It, conversely, if you go full droop and the link is too long, it's not a problem. But if the link is a half an inch too short and you go to full droop, it'll over cycle and push the bar all the way forward, over camming the system in, in essence. And it's very, very tight tolerance on an X3. Like I said, you go a quarter inch, half an inch either way, and you're gonna have a problem. And we've seen customers do it because they didn't think that maybe our measurements that we give are that important, and on an X3 it really is. You've seen a lot of that, right, Steve? Oh yeah, all the time, all the time. And Mitch, in the dunes, yes. you have guys come up. I mean, I'll, I'll speak for you, but guys come up and, yeah. and the car's all uh, crooked when they're sitting there parked. It's because they've jumped it, the links were too short when they installed it, and it overcammed and bind, binds up the system. Car rides like crap, and they're wondering what to do. Well, super stiff. It- <laughs> it's super <laughs> stiff. Yeah, oh, yeah nothing's high. working, <laughs> for sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, you have to jack it up, jack it up, and then uh, pop it back in, into, where, into place and set the adjustment to the right length. Another thing that affects that, aftermarket arms. Guys, after, you know, not every aftermarket company is going to keep the sway bar mount in the same place. And if they start moving it around a half an inch, it's going to affect the overall length. It's going to affect the overall cycle. And these things need to be checked. So, but you were going to say something, I think. One of you, Mitch was. Um, the real Chaslam said, can't I just lean my body into the turn to counteract the body roll? Totally. Excellent <laughs> idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I've we, caught myself all the all time do. turning in going like this, you know, and over here, le- leaning over here. Uh, my, my navigator thinks I'm getting fresh. I did that go-kart racing <laughs> when we were all go-karts. <laughs> I'm not leaning into the turn. Oh, now. big time in go-karts, right? Shit, you know, we weigh more than the cart. Mitch. Uh, another good question. I actually, I think you can account to this too. So what's the point of having an adjustable link if it'll break, excuse my French, but shit, if it's tiny bit too long or too short? So it's a really good question. If it's not an X3, then you have a ton of ability to make, make some changes because the length isn't that big of a deal. But specifically with the X3, um, if you go a quarter inch one way or the other, you're probably okay. Half an inch, you have a problem, guaranteed. The reason that the links are adjustable, in our opinion, is because there's a lot of variance in sway bars this way to this way. They're not all perfectly flat. There's a lot of variance in the frame mounts where they're mounted from the factory. They're not all perfectly straight. There's a lot of variance in the control arm, uh, trailing arm. They're not all perfectly straight, and all those mounts are not always in the same spot. So if you want your vehicle to sit perfectly flat, with all these variances adding up to a problem, then if the car sits this way and it's loaded on the sway bar because all the mounts are in different places, you can lengthen one side and shorten one side and get the car statically level with no load on the bar when it's sitting on flat ground. So the adjustability to, to not preload it one way or the other is a reason for an adjustable link, mainly. Mitch? Service too. If, you, if the rod end wears out or heim wears out, you can unthread it and replace yeah, it. Yeah, spot on. I mean, you, you can change one. Yeah. You don't have to change the whole thing if you've got something that's threadable um, like rod end. So a couple different reasons for that. But it's a really good question. Um, what's some of the other stuff that you see people asking on sway bar stuff or body roll, Steve? So a lot of people wonder front or rear sway bars because mm-hmm. like on an X3, <clears throat> the front sway bar makes a really, really big difference. Not that the rear doesn't, but the front mm-hmm. makes a bigger difference. But I feel like on the XP, a rear bar makes a bigger difference in the front, depending on what it is. You know what? It's a really good question also, and it is chassis specific. It has to do with how the factory designed it, 
maybe it came out from them with a rear bar that was really, really light. Um, and it needs a whole lot more rear bar to, to, to be even balanced or stable in a corner the way we drive them, right? Well, the XPs and XP turbos, perfect example, rear bar wakes them up. Um, but the opposite's the case on an X3. X3 has a pretty decent rear sway bar on it. It just needs adjustability. But the front, typically, if you wanna go fast in the desert or have any kind of bermed corners or rutted corners that you're running all the time, then a front bar is a bigger improvement just by doing a front um, over a rear on an X3 and especially on a four seater because the wheelbase and the weight, it really needs a whole lot more front bar to be balanced. How do you know when the bar is off front or rear? Um, we get that question a lot. So if, the, if you're under sway barred in the front or you don't have a sway bar in the front or you have one that's too light, Characteristic of that is when you're coming into a corner on the brakes, it's not the braking that causes the problem. I'm just saying on the brakes because you're decelerating as you enter a corner and start to turn in, it'll take a set on the front right corner in a left-hand turn. It'll take that set too far down on the outside corner and pick the inside rear tire up off the ground. As it starts to three-wheel around the corner, that's a sign of a front bar not being stiff enough. It also is a sign I'm not having enough coil spring, but typically it's front bar. Rear, if, you, if you stiffen the front bar and it starts to balance out, what'll happen is you enter the corner, it doesn't dive so much in the front and the back tire still on the ground, comes up flatter. If you over bar or over sway bar, or over stiffen too much rate for a front bar, as you come into the corner, you turn and it pushes straight through the corner. It actually doesn't get any traction because it's picking up the inside tire so much, it's only on one tire. So pushes, too much bar, balanced, you'll know all four tires are on the ground, especially when you get in the gas, and uh, not enough bar picks up the back tire and dives the outside corner, Mitch. Uh, how about the difference between a single piece bar versus a three piece sway bar? So good question. Um, there is zero difference in performance between uh, a splined bar with arms on it, which would be the same bar that's on and X3, I'm not gonna go look at that. Right Pro now. R. Sorry, Pro R, yeah, thank you. Actually, so do me a favor on this. Don't show anything below, okay? <laughs> keep up high. We'll keep this one up high. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just look at this, there we go. Right? There you go, look up there. So, Can we see back in there? Back up in there, that's a splined arm on a, on a, a splined bar, which is a three-piece bar. That's every Pro R, okay? And then everything else pretty much is a single piece bar or <laughs> Back standard down. is a single piece bar. The difference is they both function the same. They're both based on spring rates in the bar. Uh, the, the math is a little bit different, but not very much. Uh, it's more expensive to do a spline bar. Um, it's um, also typically a splined bar, um, the sway bar arms in off-road don't tend to last very long. The aluminum spline on a steel bar, you usually lose those splines. Now, on an aftermarket one especially, and most of the aftermarket ones are based around inch and a quarter diameter bars, because that's kind of what's standard issue for um, speedway racing, for dirt track, um, all that kind of, all that stuff's inch and a quarter. Inch and a quarter bar, splined, <coughs> typically, in, in our uh, experience, strips the arms off of it, and it happens over time, might take a season, might take a race, might take two seasons, but they don't last very long. Also, inch and a quarter bar tend to be hollow. Hollow sway bars that are splined have a shelf life. They have a cycle time of about 100,000 cycles. After that, you're gonna start breaking spline bars. One of the reasons why we run a solid bar and a solid bar that's one piece is because of longevity. The rates, the reaction, everything, how it works is the same but you don't have the issue with ripping splines off, you don't have an issue with the arms coming loose, and you certainly have way more cycle time, up into the half a million, 600,000 cycles when you're talking about a solid bar versus a hollow one. So that's why we run all solid bars on everything, uh, especially, and try to run single piece on everything because of longevity and less breakage and less failures. Yes. Another question I get all the time, <clears throat> Justin, with links is the Walker Evans little uh, shock, link. shock link. What yeah. do you think about the shock links? So shock links are a great idea if you, don't, if you 
are driving mostly in independent terrain and rock crawling slow stuff where you want the inside tire and outside tire to go the opposite direction for independence. They will give you a little bit of that. The ride quality improves just a little bit because the chop and chatter isn't transferred through the bar, but you're gonna gain body roll. If you put a link, a walker link or anyone's shock link on your vehicle, it will gain body roll. You will have a bigger tendency to roll the car over in a corner that's high speed. Period. End of story. You're not going to have a handling vehicle anymore. You're going to have more of a rock crawly slow one. So walker links are great for what they are designed to do and you just need to understand what, how you drive and the way you drive is dependent on whether you need that or not. Mitch. Um, how does sway bar affect understeer? Too stiff of rear equals more understeer, right? Well, I was just, let me, let me back into that. So I was just saying uh, too much front sway bar gives understeer. You're turning in and it'll push. Um, not enough front sway bar will create oversteer, which you can turn in, it'll bite up and pick up the back tire. Um, in the back is the opposite, I think, if I'm right. What did he, what did he suggest? I forget. Um, <clears throat> too stiff of rear equals more understeer. <sighs> understeer. Actually, I think it's the opposite way. I think it's the opposite way because you turn, if you turn in, the front isn't the problem and the back is super, super stiff. The back's gonna wanna pick the back tire slightly up and keep it flat, which is gonna wanna be skatey. The back is, you turn in, the back's gonna come around pretty quick. If you don't have enough bar on the back and you turn in, it's gonna leave the inside tire on the ground for a long time. So it's not gonna slide on you, but it's gonna have more body roll if you don't have enough bar on the back. I'm not the expert in road racing, okay? In, in off-road, there's other factors because you don't have traction in the dirt. But that's where I think that would be. <clears throat> Yes. Can you overcome sway bars by increasing springs? Um, yes and no. We'll talk about their relationship. A sway bar and spring package should, if you want the best performing system, be mated. And you'll see that a lot in like NASCAR. Guys will throw more spring or less spring, more bar as a combination because the spring rate in the bar subtracts basically the function of spring rate of the spring and vice versa. So you want something that's tuned. Um, let's go to some of the cures. <clears throat> Before I get over there, let's talk about shock tune because I do have one here. When you talk about tune, let's take this bypass apart. <clears throat> On a bypass shock, these bypass ports are designed to allow oil to pass around the piston. So any oil that's not going through the piston but is going around the piston is low speed and kind of a plush effect. Low speed and plush typically causes more body roll. So you wanna choose between the ride quality that you are looking for and how you drive and the body roll that you need for how you drive. There is definitely a correlation between the two. But if you wanted to help body roll then in, in a shock like this, what you would do is add a ton more rebound valving to it. If you slow the rebound down, then in essence, when you come into the corner and the outside compresses, uh, the inside wants to extend. If you slow that down with valving and uh, slow that tire extension down, it in effect keeps the car flatter by forcing the inside tires back onto the ground or the uh, weight of the vehicle back on the ground. The problem with doing this curing body roll with valving <clears throat> is it will improve the corner, it'll improve body roll, it will ruin everything else about how the suspension is designed to work. Every bump, every jump, every rock, every whoop, anything you hit will be ruined by doing enough rebound to control body roll. So not something that we recommend, but it is a cause and definitely could be something. Another thing that we get customers asking all the time is do limit straps help my body roll? Limit straps do nothing to eliminate or fix or help or cause body roll to get worse. A limit strap is strictly holding the shock from going to full extension at the last half of an inch, quarter of an inch. You're never gonna get to that full extension in a corner. You would have to limit this so far on the inside so that when you came in a corner, it held the shock up so that the car would fall back down and help you. And that would ruin everything else about a UTV suspension design. You might be able to get away with that stuff in road racing, but you're not gonna be able to do that on anything off-road. So. <clears throat> Limit straps do not affect body roll. They help shock life and stop extension clunk. Pretty much all the way around, right? Well, wait a oh, second. John, so you got more? What, I've heard of people on the Pro-Rs um, 
choking up the droop a lot. So if you yeah. choke that up two inches on each side, wouldn't that help? Um, I'm not saying that's a good idea, it, but... It, if, you, if you took a bypass shock, a Pro-R, a Dynamics, anything that's got a rebound extension stage in it and choke the system up enough to not be in that rebound stage, let's look at what that is. <clears throat> There's a bypass shock, piston goes inside, right? Let's say that's your full extension. Let me come and put this back down here. What happens is when this is compressed and now you're allowing the shock to extend out, if you choke the system up to where you're gonna stop it par part of the way, instead of letting it go all the way out, what you've done is you've taken this hydraulic extension rebound stage out of the system. This piston, as it comes down past these ports, slows down hydraulically. The, when these are shut off, this piston rate or speed or shaft speed as it's coming out might have been <clears throat> a thousand pounds of force shooting out. But as soon as a piston passes these ports, it slows down to two or 300 pounds of force. Once it gets to the end, this coil spring slows down the last couple hundred pounds of extension force. That stops this whole system from going bam and ripping the piston off of it, right? That's also why we build limit straps, to stop this from going all the way out and failing parts on the inside. If you don't allow this to come into that rebound stage because you choke the system up two inches, then you've instantly ruined everything about how this was designed. You have taken that extension slowdown period and thrown it out the window. So now all those extension forces are full force to stopping wherever you've choked it to. To do this right, if someone was to have done that, they should have been smart enough to do another tube and raise all these ports up so that they get their extension slowdown period in the right zone. Without doing that, let me put it this way. It's not the limit strap stop job to stop it that short because it's over speeding as it is. If you didn't have a strap on it and you shorten the system with, extent, with internal spacers like this one is and shorten the shock by two inches, and didn't change those extension rebound uh, ports, you then would have come out full force, 1,000 pounds, 1,500 pounds, and you would have ripped the piston right off this and, and snapped the shaft. That would have happened, period. So anybody doing that, you need to design a bypass tube. Otherwise, you shouldn't be making these changes. You're an idiot. <laughs> <clears throat> there you go. Leave it to premature John to talk about choking up two inches of shaft movement. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, John. I didn't figure you for the dick jokes. <laughs> Steve, you want to take over on that? Damn it. <laughs> it's a rock crawling thing. All right, sorry, I got on my soapbox uh, about that, but uh, you know what, people? Just uh, don't change things uh, too far away from the way they're designed factory. You're gonna get, run into a lot of, uh, it's a domino effect. You're gonna cr create a lot of issues that maybe you don't even know about. Fixes for, for body roll. Um, you guys have any questions before I move on? Keep rocking. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> fixes. You can change a lot of stuff. Now, sway bars. Sway bars both in adjustment and in rate. You can easily just go with a thicker sway bar or a higher spring rate sway bar, and that will immediately eliminate most of your body roll. But the other option is to go with a sway bar that's adjustable. So just like this one, which is one of ours, it's got three positions to adjust instead of just a single position like the factory one. So the way you adjust these, this is the pivoting point in the front of this bar the way I've got it, but it doesn't matter if there's a front or a rear bar, the farther away you get from the bushing or pivoting point on the frame, the softer the bar will be, the more body roll you will have. So if you adjust the link to the rear hole, you get more body roll, but you also get more independence. The farther forward you go, or the closer that you go to the bushing or pivot point on the frame, the stiffer the bar is going to be, and the less body roll you have. This is a tuning device, and this is why all of our sway bars that we build have multiple holes in it, so that you can tune exactly how much bar you want, how much uh, body roll you want, because if you're rock crawling, you want a lot of body roll. Slow speed, independence. If you're going any faster than 35 miles an hour in a corner, you're gonna want some sway bar in it, but if you're going faster than that in a bermed corner, you're gonna want a lot of sway bar in it. So it depends on how you drive and where you're driving, where you want that. Adjustable sway bar, super important. More sway bar, stiffer bar, or less bar, the second option, 
when it comes to adjustability. Mitch, did you have something or are you good? Nope. Okay, shock tune, adjustment. Two ways to adjust it. Like we talked about, you can stiffen up the valving. Bad idea for off-road. This is something you do in road racing, but not anything off-road. You would slow down some of the porting. If there's any kind of free bleed porting or free bleed shims in the, in the stack, you would eliminate those, but you're also gonna get crappy ride quality. As soon as you do that, you're gonna feel all the chop and chatter and rocks. You're not gonna like that either. So shock internal tuning, not a good idea when it comes to tuning body roll with that. But adjustments, adjustability is something that you can definitely do, external adjustments. Typically, on most shocks, you're gonna have either a single compression adjustment, which as you stiffen it up, it's gonna slow the shock down, it's gonna limit some body roll. But if you have a dual compression adjuster or DSC, which like say for instance on a Fox, is gonna be a 17 millimeter outer, it's gonna be a standard screwdriver center. The screwdriver adjustment in the middle of that DSC is low speed, that is, Low speed movements, shocks not moving very fast, which is body roll, it's boatiness, that's mainly what that's tuning. If you start turning that in, or stiffening it up, or slowing down the low speed, then your body roll is going to be limited. The problem there is, the same as the valving, the farther you go, the more you're gonna feel in the plush department, chop, chatter, and all that kind of stuff comes into play. So again, which one do you want? Less body roll, more chop, less chop, more body roll. They're definitely hand to hand when it comes to adjustments on the shock or internals. Smart shocks. This is, uh, I say smart shocks, dynamics, or basically anything live valve that's going to be um, Pro R, it's going to be you know, X2 shocks on um, the Yamahas, it's going to be anything live, smart shocks on K Ams. These are really the key and probably the best all around way to control body roll, some of it right now, uh, a lot in the Pro R, but a whole lot coming in the future. Electronics with dual valve, rebound and a compression can really eliminate and, or, or um, allow you to tune body roll because the computer can sense when you come into a corner and it will throw a ton of rebound on the inside shocks, keeping the body flat and stiffening the low speed compression on the outside shocks keeping the outside from dipping down. So the shock and live assembly and, and live valve of ability of shocks and the computer algorithms connected to the sensors in the car, that's the best way to, to tune body roll. You can't run just the shock. You just can't. Um, you need to have some sway bar on the car and a shock that controls it. The two are gonna work together. But in the future, that's gonna be the number one way to do it and kind of gain all the benefits, because if it's only tuning it for a corner, as soon as you straighten the wheel, it all goes plush and you don't feel the chop and chatter like you would if you made a solid adjustment that, that that's that way all the time. Um, spring package, I didn't mention it over here on the causes, it is on the fixes. The reason is, if you run a very lightweight spring package, let's say I'm exaggerating and just say half the rates that you need, then yes, it's gonna be more boaty and it's gonna have more body roll when you come in and out of, the, out of the corner. A little bit. If you run a stiffer spring package, it's gonna have less body roll, but a little bit. And here's why it's just a little bit. It's not the biggest factor when, it, when it's, we're talking about this stuff. Because if you soften up the spring, the outside's going to dip uh, a little bit because of the spring rate being light, but the inside, does not have very much spring rate pushing that shock out, which means it's just like putting a ton of rebound into it and a light spring on the inside is gonna allow the car to fall to the inside or keep the tire up. It's not gonna shoot out as fast. So the, negate, the, the problem of light on the outside is counteracted by light on the inside. It doesn't push it out from a rebound standpoint. Stiff does the same thing. Stiffer on the outside, a little less body roll, but it shoots the rebound side out with more spring force. So it allows more body roll because it doesn't choke up the rebound on the inside of the corner. So springs do affect it, but it's not a huge factor both ways. What really affects it is location of crossover ring. So where that crossover is on the body, if you were to lower that excessively, then it will stiffen up the outside a ton and not shoot the tire out on the inside. It'll keep that slow. So crossovers are a huge difference in the spring package when it comes to tuning body roll not so much, yes, spring rate does change it, but not as much in the spring rate as it is in the crossover. Links, um, as we said, if you can get rid of the stock 
say, rubber bushing style link and go to a solid link, then that will definitely limit some body roll and give you some adjustability. And ride height, as we said, if it's too tall, you're gonna have, right, you're gonna have more body roll. If it's lower, you're gonna have less. But you have negatives with all of this stuff. Let's point out what those are. On the sway bar, if you go too stiff on the bar, then it gets, you can start to feel the chop. Meaning your independence is not very high and you can feel rocks on the right side and not on the left, which kind of kicks your head back and forth. So the ride quality can go downhill if you over bar the system. He made a mistake. On the shock tune, if you start putting too much rebound in it, again, you're gonna start feeling the chop. It won't run through the whoops. If you shut off the slow speed, it's gonna get stiff. Everything about how a shock functions is gonna to go to the worse if you overvalve it or you change the adjustments too far. Um, did you guys have something you wanted to cover before I go? Okay, then smart shocks, dynamics. The negative with this is just the cost. <laughs> I mean, another $5,000 option uh, on the vehicle, that's about the only negative I can come up with because everything about how a smart system works is gonna work better when it comes to body roll. And what was done in the past is light years behind what is here today. Like what's on a Pro R is night and day better than stuff two years ago. And two years from now, it's gonna be night, light years ahead of that and more controllable. Steve. You know, Justin, you, you, we say it all the time. I can't tell you how many people, every time we talk to them, regret not buying the live valve or the dynamic shocks. It is insane. They, they, mm -hmm. they say after their, I just wish I would've spent the extra five grand. It's worth it all day long. And we get that question, Daily, 10 times a day, right? Which one should I buy, non or, or this? It's a lot of money, is it worth it? Should I just tune the non-live shocks, have you guys do that, and save the money on the overall package? I mean, yeah, we can make the non-lives work amazingly better than they do stock, but it's not gonna be anywhere near the live stuff once we tune it. It's but worth the money, I was, I'll say I it again. I think that's even more so on the Pro R than it is on the X3. Agreed, and the reason, uh, good to point that out, John, is because the, X, the, the Pro R, has an X2 style shock, which is a dual adjuster, rebound and compression, where everything prior to that is basically a single adjuster, or compression only. When you run compression and rebound, now you can control all the body roll with the rebound function. Um, you can co control a little bit of it with the compression, but without a rebound function, you're not gonna have a ja drastic change, computer-wise, tune-wise, in body roll, but now you do. And it's just gonna get better. That stuff is all being worked on light speed right now. It really is. You're going to see a ton of stuff really advanced soon. Um, so the negative here is only the cost. Other than that, it works awesome. And in my opinion, probably the best package overall. Spring package, it's crossover only. There is um, really no negative to this. You, want, you always want to run the spring rates that are accurate for what you're going to run, um, drive and high, high, with terrain and stuff, um, and the weight and, and accessories on your vehicle. That, you should never really be changing that kind of stuff. You can if you're specific, I'm going to run short course. All right, run, run it stiff. Um, or I'm specific, I rock crawl, that's all I do. Okay, cool, you can go lighter. But if you're gonna do a little bit of everything, then you need to do the spring rates, just like you would always do them, the proper rates for 90% for of what you're gonna do. If, you're gonna, if you really wanna affect the, the body roll, then do crossover ring adjustment only, and that's it. Links, there isn't a negative other than the cost, having to buy them, ride height, Never raise the vehicle too high, never lower it too low, especially because of piston location in that shock. This piston has a zone where it likes to be, and if it's not in its happy place because you raised the vehicle too high, or you lowered the vehicle too much, if you lower it, it's gonna come up into the bump zone real, real quick and it's gonna ride stiff. If you raise it right here, it's gonna ride stiff all the time because the spring rates are too high because you crank the ride height up and you don't get this nice plush zone. So you want it to be in its happy place. You really don't want to raise the right height or lower the right height more than a couple of inches either direction. So I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't get too carried away in that department. What's the best way to, to control body roll when everything has a negative attached to it? It's a combination of everything. It is the package. You choose the car, the UTV that's best for your needs That'll get you the geometry in the right spot. You um, choose the location of your accessories the best you can. Keep them low. You're not gonna have body roll as much as you do if you shove them on the roof. You would um, do a shock tune and a spring package for 90% of what you're going to do. 
UTVs have wheel travel for a reason. Off-road, travel, whoops, rock, whatever it might be, tune it for that. Sway bar. Every UTV, in my opinion, needs to have a sway bar on it. They should be adjustable. They should be close in tune from a spring rate standpoint, not too stiff, not too hard. That's why adjustability is important. But if all you're going to do is rock crawl all day, I have no problem with you taking the sway bar off or both of them, whatever you want to do. But the second that you go 30, 40 mile an hour around a corner on asphalt with traction, you're going to roll it. So you need to make sure that you're used to what it does when the sway bars are off of it. You need to make sure that you attach them again if you're going to change your terrain and driving style. Otherwise, you're going to run into issues because there's no way to do both when you have no sway bar on the vehicle. And if you did, you'd have to overspring it, overshock it, lower the car, and everything about the vehicle is going to suck and ride like crap except for turning if that's all you did and designed it around. Tires, that's pretty obvious. Pick your favorite tire. Most of the good quality stuff, you know, um, methods, uh, method wheels, tens or tires, um, there's a ton of others out there, John, you can speak to a ton of them, right? Um, that are quality, sidewall construction, strong tire. Most of that stuff's great. You just don't want to run a single or double ply sidewall on anything in the UTVs. It's just too soft. And tire pressure. And tire pressure, you know, control that. You don't want to run, run around 6 PSI in the dirt. You want to keep that up at 12 to 16, somewhere in that range. And same with the sand. Um, we should talk about sand. Geometry, we already talked about. So once you, you choose the way you want to drive it, choose the accessories you're going to run on it, where you're going to drive most of the time, then, for instance, we can tune it the best to fit all terrains. And that would be a combination of the shock internals, the spring package, and the sway bar choice that's adjustable. Then at least you can change it and manipulate it for what you want to do. We, we do tunes for people that um, just want to turn. That's their whole con goal. And um, sometimes we limit the travel. If we do Lucas Oil or short course or core racing or anything like that, then the fastest car around the track is basically a skateboard. No suspension travel, nothing. Choke the thing up, low as you can make it, stiff as a board, that's gonna be the fastest vehicle. As soon as you start allowing things to move and have sway bars that allow too much body roll in the system, it's not fast. That's actually not drivable on, on, even on the street. It's not drivable in the dunes, it's not drivable in the dirt, it's not drivable in the desert, certainly not drivable in the whoops and rocks. So that's specific tuned for things like that, we'll do it. But usually a, a, something that you can adjust that's kind of all around is the best place to be. Steve. Yes, Justin. You were just dreaming about turning. When we're talking about Lucas Oil, you're thinking, I am an IndyCar driver. I was thinking about Lucas Oil and thinking mm -hmm. how we don't do much short course. That's mm -hmm. all I was thinking. But I keep thinking about body roll and how I should go to the gym. Mm, <laughs> so yes. I, yeah, ever Back since you body, said body roll, all I was thinking about was gym membership. Body roll plural yes. is what you're thinking. <laughs> yes, yes. Mitch, it looked like you had somebody that wanted to chat. Uh, Maybe we should talk to them. Uh, I got sand, dot, dot, dot. Yes, talk about it. Talk about what? Sand. 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 Yes, sand, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I thought he I said thought Sam. You, I thought that was his name. <laughs> <laughs> sand says, sand. talk about it. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, you know, out here we've got dunes, we've got desert, right? And we've got some rock crawling, especially when you get into Utah. What's the setup difference? Well, body roll is a personal preference. <clears throat> some guys like to have a bunch, some guys don't like to have any, and some guys drive one direction or differently than others. This does not, what I'm about to tell you, it doesn't mean this is the way you should do it. You might like it completely different. It doesn't matter. You, you get the thing tuned the way you like. Right, Steve? Different strokes for yes. different folks. Yeah, that's right. Some like the rolls, some <laughs> like this roll. But um, typically, the dunes with the right front tire, maybe something that's got a razor on it or a buff that's got traction, a, a, maybe a, a ridge and a, and a buff, something that's got a lot of front bite, you actually have more side bite in the dunes than you do in the dirt in a lot of areas. So I personally love having sway bars on a car in the dunes and control the body roll even more so in the dunes than I would in the dirt. And in rock crawling, I wouldn't want the bars on it at all. So three different areas, three different preferences, that's me. Now, some guys like to drive in two-wheel drive in the, in, the, in the dunes and slide the thing around all the time and drive sideways on every corner. Totally cool. You can do that, like, for instance, with no front bar or too much rear bar in it or, or vice versa. You can tune it for what you want. So in, in general, sand has more side bite with the correct tire needs more body roll control if you want to drive fast, if you just want to drive fun, tune it for however you want, and slide the thing around as much as you want, 
and uh, change the tires accordingly. Good enough, John? Yeah, yeah. What else you got? Man of many words. <laughs> I know. You know. So, <laughs> excuse me, John. Yeah. Tell me exactly what you would like to talk about. Well, Expand, well, sir. I like Beat to around rock the crawl. bush, John, over here. <laughs> so I, I like to rock crawl, but I do yeah. everything. I yeah. go, I desert ride, trail ride, dunes, everything. So on mm -hmm. my X3, I've got a smart shocks. Mm -hmm. I took the front bar and disconnected it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would have done that if I didn't have a smart shocks because it's helping to compensate for that. Oh, you're bit. spot on, John. A smart shock car, man, it is controlling some body roll. It has all the sensors to know when you're turning in and it's making adjustments. So a smart shot car, a, a, any live valve car, would be a much easier UTV to pull sway bar off of and have less negatives but in when, the system. But when I go to Glamis, though, <laughs> I do notice it. Mm -hmm. um, I've got the stock sway bar on the rear. Probably it would be best if, I if I'm gonna keep the front off to do the adjustable in the rear and then I could stiffen it up just for the dunes and that would help compensate a bit. Yeah, and, and you know, there's the, the next guy in line um, might prefer no bars. He's not going to be fast in a corner, but he likes to drive it that way for dune transfers. Yeah. That's just the way he would drive. And the next guy in line might want all the sway bars in the world and not care about the dune transfer because he's airing it out and launching it on every one of them and doesn't really care about it falling over into those, or he wants the corners to be faster. So different strokes for different folks, Steve. Right. Yes, Justin. And I actually realized I don't like body roll when I drove that uh, Pro R that you guys took down to Baja, that um, black one. Oh, which one? Oh, yeah. It had no yeah. sway bars on it, and I drove <laughs> that thing, and yeah. I had to pull the seat out of my butt because I puckered so hard when I got to my destination. <laughs> Can you imagine having no bars on the thing In Mexico? when you're rock crawling and you're like, hey, I'm going to take the highway to the next trail, <laughs> oh. and you get on the highway, whoop, 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 you know, you can touch the ground. It was the door. scary. Yeah, it'll happen. So, you know, you. Tune it for what you like. So what year was it that, uh, what was the first vehicle that had two sway bars on it, a UTV? I believe the Flintstones made it. <laughs> <laughs> UTV. Oh, UTV, okay, sorry. Um, Steve, those, those would be bones. It'd be a bone in the exactly. front and a bone in the back for Was that XP1000? Uh, XP Turbo. Yeah, I believe it was a Turbo. Turbo or X, Fox X, Edition. It was Fox Edition, same chassis. So Fox but Edition was, Turbo. Fox Edition was first. <clears throat> 2015 then. Okay, so Fox Edition had a factory front bar. That would be the first of like the modern era of big, say, horsepower turbo cars, right? Yeah. So certainly from XP1000 or XP900 on, it would have been, it would have been that. Front, front only, yeah. or rear only, sorry. Yeah, maybe in, in utility, they might have had one in the front, like on a gator. Yeah, but those are so <laughs> stiff, they don't move anyways, and you're going right. so slow, who cares? Right, so Fox Edition would be the first one with four. All right. And, and then the first, like, well, no, you're right, you're right. I was going to say that the and first one was an X3. Everything since, sport-wise, <clears throat> has come with front and rear sway bars. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, and I kind of laugh when guys on the internet are like, oh, just take those off. You don't need them. Well, you know well, how much of money and engineering went into that? There's a reason. But you're talking to the Utah guys. I mean, if you're going to yeah. go to Sand Hollow, Moab, all that kind of stuff, rock crawl. For specific driving, there's a, there's a place for no sway bars. Most all these guys toss the front to sway bar. First thing. Yeah, bars off. That's great. I get it. That's what they need. That's what they, need, what they should do. And, and I agree. Um, we just don't rock crawl a lot, so it's not our wheel. I didn't toss line. mine. I just disconnected it. It's a Jeep uh, thing, Justin. You just wouldn't yeah, understand. I wouldn't understand. I guarantee you I would not understand. That's Too slow. Sure. Hey, if you guys don't have anything for a speed round, you got any quickies that you saw, if you don't have any questions, then we will sign out of our body rolls discussion. As Steve would put it. I love head, a good quickie, Justin, but I have nothing. Okay. Everybody's out. We're going to we head to nothing. the gym. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Hopefully, sway bar discussions and uh, body roll discussions. And the fact that limit strap does nothing for anything in off road to limit body roll uh, helps you a little bit and uh, gives you a direction that you might want to go when it comes to tuning this stuff to get it the way you want it to be. So, with that, I'm going to let Steve take us out of here with uh, Steve, body rolls, bikes. If you guys are looking to get rid of those body rolls, try joining a gym. But if you're trying to get rid of the body roll in your car, visit our website, www.shocktherapyusa.com, or give us a call, 623-217-4959.